Thanks so much for the introduction and also thank the organizers for inviting me to this very exciting conference. I think I learned a lot in the last two days about high UV disinfection. And uh, of course, uh, most of these studies uh, have been done with uh, 222 nanometer XML lamps. And that brings me also to the topic of my talk. I'm trying to present you some update on a semiconductor based uh, UV source uh, using group three nitride uh, materials for realizing uh, far UVC light emitting diodes in the 233 and uh, shorter wavelengths range. This is work done at the Technical University of Berlin, the Stephen Brown Institute. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the overall scope of this uh, research activities and also motivate why maybe UVC LEDs or far UVC LEDs might be beneficial for some of your application, um, but also we'll have some more technical slides for the experts here in the room uh, to update you about the progress in this LED development. So please uh, uh, bear with me uh, during these more technical portions. So if you look at the UV spectrum, of course, we divide up in UV A, B, and C. And I also plotted down here the materials composition range in the nitrides that can, and can address these uh, wavelengths. And you all already use uh, nitride devices as blue and white and green LEDs in your uh, solid state lighting in your laptops and mobile phones. Um, and if you add uh, aluminum nitride to the mixture, you can push the wavelengths uh, towards shorter and shorter uh, UV. The ultimate limit is basically the aluminum nitride band gap, which would be 210 nanometers. So we can generate LEDs somewhere between 400 and 210 nanometer with this uh, technology. And in the UVA spectral range, actually these LEDs, these nitride LEDs are already commercial and highly efficient ball plug efficiencies in the ex ex excess of 40%, uh, one watt or more output power per single chip. So there this technology is already used in UV curing and 3D printing applications in lithography and, and many other things. As you go to the shorter wavelengths in the UVB spectral range, we have applications in phototherapy and, and horticulture. Um, and our focus and the focus of most R&D in this UV LED business is in this so-called uh, uh, germicidal uh, range between 250 to 280 nanometer with, as you know, more in applications in water treatment, air disinfection and, and sterilization. And more recently, as uh, driven by uh, the finding work, from uh, David Brenner. We also have got interested in the shorter wavelengths of far UVC, uh, 230 nanometer, roughly what we are focusing on for in vivo disinfection. And you heard the talk by Johannes Schleusner just in the previous session with a focus on uh, inactivating MRSA, uh, but also now other uh, pathogens like viruses and fungi. Of course, you can do much more with these UVC uh, LEDs in the area of sensing and communication, photo ionization. But uh, in this talk, we're going to focus on this in vivo in activation part. So, why is a LED, or what is the, what are the uh, special properties of, of UV LEDs? And I've listed some of the key features here uh, in this slide. Most of all, uh, the wavelengths is really selectable, so we can really tune the wavelengths uh, to fit exactly the ideal uh, uh, for the application ideal uh, uh, spectrum. And you can see actually LEDs that we've made. Uh, within our consortium over the years, ranging roughly between 400 nanometer and the shortest this year, 217 uh, nanometer. They're environmentally friendly. Uh, they can also be turned on and off very quickly, milliseconds to nanoseconds. They're electronically dimmable, so you can range uh, any power level electrically uh, driven. Uh, this is LEDs are so very compact, so you can see here actually a typical LED chip. So in this respect, the, the LED chip itself, about a square millimeter of semiconductor in, in a package, which is about three and a half by three and a half uh, square millimeters. They're very robust. They can be operated with low voltages and typically have long lifetimes, at least if they're fully developed. There's also some drawbacks. Currently, the uh, uh, cost factor is an issue for many applications, so the dollars per watt. Uh, uh, and also the wall plug efficiencies are not yet up to par with the competitive uh, or competing technologies. So in a disinfection band, we have uh, wall plug efficiencies are not quite reaching yet 10% for commercial products. 
um, and for 230, they're still uh, below 1%. And this is what I'm going to discuss uh, in this, this talk in more detail. In order to give you, again, a, a little bit broader scope, um, this is some of the, the forecasts for UVC LEDs in the disinfection band between 250 and 280 nanometer. And also in this area, the uh, COVID pandemic has really uh, helped to create more momentum for this uh, industry and, and R&D. Uh, in the spectral range driven by air and surface disinfection and, and water treatment. We also think that regulation and standards uh, covering the safety and efficiency of these devices are still missing, especially for the uh, application and products. Nevertheless, we can see uh, a steady increase uh, in the power and efficiencies of these devices, uh, mainly driven by higher efficiencies, larger chips, advanced packaging that uh, allows us to run these devices in uh, higher currents. And you can see in this chart here, the output power per LED chip in this uh, germicidal effectiveness peak band is around uh, 200 milliwatt already. Um, in addition, lifetimes and uh, reliability of these LEDs, these are already commercially available, uh, have really reached uh, very good levels already, 10,000 hours, 20,000 hours by, uh, guaranteed by these manufacturers. So this uh, field is actually very fast moving forward and hopefully this will also translate to higher efficiency and long lifetime LEDs in the 230 nanometer wavelength band. For many applications, the price uh, is really the, the critical issue and um, trying to predict what the development of the uh, dollars per watt uh, or euro per watt uh, development is, is not so easy, but uh, you can try and uh, actually this has been actually shown to, to uh, work as, as a so-called Heights law that was uh, originally proposed by Roland Heights, a uh, researcher uh, at Agilent and later Philips Luminance Lighting that looked at the efficiency uh, increases and the uh, cost decreases for visible LEDs, uh, blue, white LEDs over the years. And uh, he found actually this the cost per lumen drops by a factor of 10 every decade roughly. And I've plotted that again here in my slide, and it actually continues to do this uh, uh, drop in uh, uh, pricing for these white LEDs. And the question is, does the UVC LED technology, which is basically a similar material system, uh, similar technology, also follow this, this law, this rule? And when you look at the UVC LEDs, again, these are 250 to 280 nanometer LEDs. Uh, you can see the uh, same trend actually even faster than the uh, trend for the blue LEDs. So um, we still, of course, one and a half orders magnitude above the cost level of a mercury lamp. But you can see clearly in maybe in the 10 years, you can reach that level. And you don't even need a level to re be reached in order to be competitive because LEDs have so many other uh, advantages. So uh, another important parameter to, to compare and to look at is the uh, development of the wall plug efficiency of LEDs. And again, I uh, compared here 265 nanometer LEDs, uh, which of course are highly commercial. So can really compare the performance of different products over the years. Um, and then the 230 nanometer LEDs, which are only offered by a few companies. I wouldn't call them yet products, but like engineering prototypes that you can already commercially uh, attain. So for the uh, 265 nanometer range, you can see, again, a clear trend towards higher and higher wall plug efficiency. I, I would say that the 10% uh, level is within the reach in the next one or two years. And then the question is, when we're we reaching 20%, because that's basically touching then the efficiency of mercury lamps. And um, that should also be attainable within the next decade. And actually, the manufacturers, uh, especially um, companies like Osram, have already announced that they actually have a much more aggressive uh, agenda, which uh, plans to have 20% uh, uh, wall plug efficiency within the next three years. What about the 230 nanometer range? This is basically the few data points I could find for these devices. Of course, the whole development started much later, so we are a little bit behind the curve. Uh, of the 265 nanometer LEDs, but we also see a steady increase in the wall plug efficiency of these devices, even though they're still below this 1% level. But I would think, I mean, I'm very optimistic that this will be reached very soon. And inter interestingly, we talk about cryptochloride lamps a lot, 
Um, the efficiency of these lamps, to my surprise, uh, also is not that large, not that great. So the cap here is also quite small to, 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 um, to close. And I would say it's not impossible to think about exceeding the efficiency of a Merkel lamp in the long-term future. So um, where we are and where the points where we uh, have to improve, um, I try to analyze this uh, um, in the slide. So it's a bit, um, uh, a few formulas, but they're very basic. So at the end, what you care about is the wall plug efficiency of your device. And that's the product of the external quantum efficiency, they call EQE, and the electrical efficiency. And the external quantum, uh, quantum efficiency, again, is a product of your radiative efficiency. That basically tells you how efficient an electron hole pair in your semiconductor creates a photon. And the injection efficiency uh, tells you how likely it is that an electron in the hole will get into your uh, quantum well in the active region. And then the extraction efficiency describes how likely it is that the photon actually can leave the semiconductor to be useful. And that's actually not so easy because you have a high index material and, and uh, um, a narrow angle of um, a narrow escape cone. And that basically is one of the uh, issues to, to overcome. So if you look at blue LED technology, which is highly developed, and you can look at all these parameters, all these numbers are in the 90 percentile. So the overall EQE and wall plug efficiency are 84 and 81 percent. This is the most efficient light source ever made uh, by a human being. So if you compare it to the UVC LEDs, uh, this is 268, and it's based on two papers by Sang et al. that analyzed the LEDs in more detail. You can see. Um, there's a, a, a gap in the IQ, in the internal quantum efficiency uh, for these devices, a, a huge gap in the light extraction efficiency um, uh, for these devices, and also some uh, gap in the electrical efficiency. So these parameters are the parameters one has to improve in order to get to higher efficiency. This is then the 8% wall plug efficiency for these commercial 280, 268 nanometer LEDs we've seen. In a similar picture, we'll find for 230, and we'll analyze that in a moment. So in order to get a better idea of what we really have to do in order to improve the LED efficiencies and output powers uh, at 268, but also at 230 nanometer, I've uh, drafted here a quick schematic of a LED heterostructure consisting of many different layers. Um, and uh, I don't want to go into the details of all these uh, layers the main point is uh, typically they are grown on a sapphire substrate and then already at this aluminum nitride epitaxially grown base layer we have a, a lot of challenges because of the large lattice and thermal mismatch between these different materials that causes defects to form and these threading dislocations penetrate through the semiconductor which impedes the creative recombination efficiency um, and then the overall quantum efficiency of your device. Um, there's many other uh, things that you have to consider if you want to improve these parameters and have basically connected these uh, challenges with the parameter that are correlated uh, with these uh, challenges. And I could talk about it for many, many hours. But uh, the point is that in order to get more efficient LEDs, you have to turn a lot of knobs and uh, improve a lot of different things in this heterostructure. And that's only the heterostructure but it can be done as we've seen with the blue LEDs uh, in the past. And uh, we see it also in the UVC uh, now better and better improving. Um, I wanna touch just a few uh, materials uh, challenges. And the first one is the uh, question, what substrate to use? In our case, we mostly use a sapphire substrate because it's readily available. It's available at large uh, diameters up to six inch and also it's very low cost. And of course, for UV important, it's fully UV transparent. As I already mentioned, the problem is really the high defect density when you grow uh, nitride material on these uh, uh, substrates. So they're in the range of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the uh, 10 per square centimeter. It's a huge defect density, but nevertheless, you will see that you can still make efficient devices. Uh, uh, compared to, to uh, bulk aluminum nitride, this is really the ideal substrate. It would be uh, uh, Homo epitaxially grows on, on the substrate with uh, expected much lower defect densities, uh, but the substrates are still not uh, readily available to me and are also quite costly, and the diameters are also limited. 
So we um, do at the moment 99% of our development on the sapphire substrate and this kind of, oops, uh, this gives you a little bit of a history um, or uh, chronological development in the substrate or template technology that we are using. We started with the Evitectric grown aluminum nitride on sapphire, which gets you down to the mid 10 to the 9 per, per centimeter range. Uh, then we uh, switch the architectural level overgrowth. That is a technology that allows you uh, to uh, pattern the sapphire and then overgrow it with lower dislocation densities in the 10 to the 9 uh, per, per centimeter range. Um, but it's very costly because you have to grow very thick layers, and it is uh, uh, a lot of epitaxy, and that makes the devices expensive. Um, very recently, it's just a new technology that uses sputtering and high temperature annealing at very high temperature, 1700 degrees Celsius, uh, to anneal defects and get really uh, low defect density templates in the mid times the 8 per centimeter range. And this is kind of the uh, new technology that allows also low cost manufacturing for these templates. And then, based on this, we can combine previous approaches with. We're going to double growth annealing or this ELO HDA, which we use for most of our far UVC development that gets in the low 10 to the 8 per square centimeter range. These numbers might not mean much for you, but if you, let's say, look what that corresponds to in efficiency for these LEDs, um, I, I often show this slide that basically plots the internal one efficiency of an LED over the dislocation density in the material, in the semiconductor material. And um, actually, you can see these dislocations when you look uh, on the top of uh, when you look at this cathodal luminescence image of a 268 nanometer quantum well uh, grown on this ELO HDA template. You can see all these little black dots here that are basically threading dislocations going through the active region and acting as non radiative recombination centers, which impedes your efficiency. So, what does it mean now? If, if we go from 10 to 10, Per square centimeter, you're only uh, in the one or two percent efficiency range uh, to 10 to 9, 10 to 8, then you basically can reach 80, 90 or so percent IQE values. And so this is basically also our guideline where we have to be with our template technology in order to go to get to higher efficiencies. And um, this is not only uh, predicted theoretically by this uh, blue curve, but also supported by experimental data that we have uh, looked at in our samples and also uh, in investigations on other groups. So it's quite consistent with um, uh, see in experiments. I have to make one uh, caveat, which is that this is only one type of defect. This is a spreading dislocation. And we have ignored other uh, defects like point defects that also can act as dropery tall recommendation centers and the semiconductors. And that is a defect that actually shows up particularly at high aluminum mole fraction for far UVC LEDs. So that's another challenge to, to overcome. Nevertheless, with these low defect density templates, uh, we can make decent UVC LEDs. This is now in the disinfection band 265 uh, peak at the germicidal effectiveness curve with about 7 the milliwatt output powers and most importantly also long lifetimes for these devices and actually a result is already three years old so now we finally go to the far uvc and this uh, slide we have shown, seen also from uh, johannes schleusner before looking at the penetration depths uh, of uh, uv light in dependence on the on the wavelengths these are monte carlo simulations um, using uh, absorption and scattering data obtained from analyzing uh, human skin layers. And you can see from this uh, simulation, uh, the black uh, line here is a one over E curve uh, for the intensity that around 235 to 240, basically the penetration ends uh, 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 within the stratum conium. So that's the motivation to use that wavelengths uh, or shorter wavelengths. Of course, most of the studies now have done have been done at 222, far below that, but I think 233 or something around that wavelength span can be also safe. And uh, that's what we hopefully uh, will see in, in these studies. So uh, this is about three years ago, uh, far UVC LED emitting uh, at 233 nanometer in the peak. Um, with a full width have maximum of about 11.5 nanometer. Uh, this is a log plot of the intensity, and uh, that's a bit different 
uh, in the emission uh, spectrum than what you see uh, from a axiomal lamp because it's much broader and has this uh, emission tail. Um, so that when you look at the intensity, about 18% of that light uh, is in a wavelength band uh, above 240 nanometer. And as we know, uh, this longer wavelength is detrimental for uh, uh, skin damage. And so forth. we need to avoid uh, having this light coming out of the LED. And therefore, we need uh, filtering for these LEDs. So a single LED chip produces about 1.8 milliwatt of power. And back then, the efficiency was only 0.35%. What we also can do with these LEDs nicely is tailor the uh, angle of emission by attaching, for example, a lens uh, to the LED chip. So it can go from a, a, a omnidirectional uh, lumbersion emitter to really directional light emission. And why that is interesting when you use filters, uh, I will show you in a, in a second. So for the module, so we're not only making a single LED chip, at the end, we need to make a UVC by UVC LED module that can be used uh, in these uh, medical studies. We need to filter out the light, and then we have the option of introducing a filter on the chip, or we can basically have a, a blanket larger filter away from the chip in the module and having the light tailored to come under a narrow angle onto the uh, band pass filter. And that's also the, the, the choice we made for our, our design. Uh, why is that? Um, if you look at these dielectric bandpass filters. Basically, these are quarter wavelength stacks of silicon dioxide and hafnium dioxide that um, the cutoff wavelengths for these bandpass filters will change uh, depending on the angle of incidence of the light. And if the angle increases from a particular incidence to a shallower angle, then what happens is that the cutoff wavelengths will actually shift towards shorter and shorter wavelengths, which is maybe good in terms of safety considerations. So you still cut out all the longer wavelengths light, but you also lose a lot of intensity, which we don't want to do. So ideally you want all the light to hit the filter perpendicular to its surface. So, and that's what we are doing in this LED irradiation module. So this is now an actual module that we built here with uh, 120 uh, LED chips emitting uh, at 233 nanometer. And uh, in front of this module will be, uh, or is a dielectric bandpass filter. Uh, the spectrum of this filter you can see here. So this is basically the transmission spectrum. You can see a very sharp cutoff and basically no transmission here in, in this longer wavelengths UVC uh, spectrum. And here underneath you can see the LED spectrum without a filter and then with, with a filter. And if we put everything together, you can of course characterize the entire module. You have to make sure that the light distribution is uniform. That's uh, about 90% over this seven by seven centimeter square area. And the intensity is also uh, in, a, in a range where you can actually usefully inactivate uh, MRSR and other pathogens. So we have about 0.5 milliwatt per square centimeter uh, uh, from that module. And then with that intensity, we can reach dose levels of 40 millijoule per square centimeter within 80 seconds. Um, this actually shows very nicely then the, the spectrum from this module because it's basically here, the cutoff is around 240 nanometers. So this is basically the light coming out uh, from this LED uh, module. And you can see actually, you have a, a, a spectral distribution of light between 240 and 220 nanometer uh, in, this, in this device. So you have actually a, a, a broader um, intensity distribution than in a, a axiom lamp or in a laser, which might be also interesting. So I don't want to uh, go into detail. We've seen the results from Johannes Schleusen and others. Uh, so if you use that um, uh, 233 nanometer light uh, with different uh, uh, um, uh, intensity levels, uh, we tested first how effective MRSA is disinfected or inactivated, and you get the three log reduction is about 29 millijoule per square centimeter for this investigation. And we also looked at the um, DNA damage to human skin and uh, found very little and very uh, no de detectable damage after 24 hours in this uh, clinical study. So this is uh, very um, encouraging for us also to continue further developing these devices. And that's actually what we're doing. We're trying to improve the efficiency of the LEDs and uh, because there's still a big gap between these LEDs and the um, uh, 260, 280 nanometer LEDs in this uh, germicidal dis disinfection band. So this 
order of magnitude difference. So it's still um, you know, a huge uh, task ahead of us to improve the efficiency, but I think we, we can uh, get there. And in order to get there, we, we really need to understand better where are the limiting uh, factors in the LAT performance. Uh, it's a complicated slide, but basically it plots all the three parameters that I mentioned, the light extraction efficiency, the current injection efficiency, the radiative efficiency. So overall, the external quantum efficiency drops here very rapidly at shorter wavelengths. This is, of course, not this is uh, 2019 data. And if you analyze which factor contributes, it's partly the light extraction efficiency drops, partly the radiative efficiency drops. And that has to do with these point effects that I already mentioned that become more and more prevalent at higher aluminum content at shorter wavelengths. And then also the current injection efficiency is, is dropping. And the question is, uh, is this uh, physical limits of, of the technology or can we uh, improve and engineer better devices? And of course, we think we can uh, improve in that. And we have uh, some success here already. So um, to control point effects, you can play a lot with the materials growth conditions. This is a technology called metal organic vapor phase epitaxy so that's also used for blue and green LEDs. And with that, you can basically find better growth conditions to reduce point effects, which also enhances the efficiency of your device. And so this is the next generation, which uh, had uh, five milliwatt output power and the efficiency, which already almost doubles the original one with 0.64% EQE. Um, yeah. The next iteration, that's actually a very recent result, I just want to show, just published in APL, um, using two more innovation, that's a distributed polarization doped whole injection layer. I won't explain you what, what exactly that means, but it helps to better introduce holes into the active region of the LEDs more efficiently, and also uh, grown on a new template that is even lower dislocation density, this double gross annealed template that I mentioned in the beginning. So we have now seven milliwatt output power for a single LED chip, a square millimeter of uh, LED chip, and uh, efficiency that is close now to 1% uh, for a single LED chip for this 234 nanometer devices. And so if you now analyze where we are, this is 233 nanometer technology today, you can see this new data points are all much, much improved and not so far anymore behind uh, the original 268 nanometer LED. So light extraction is still the biggest gap with only 6%. So we actually generate much more light. 94% of the light is not coming out of the chip. So it's there, but we cannot extract it. So there's a lot of things we can gain, improving light extraction efficiency. The radiative efficiency is about 40%, and the current injection efficiency is about 30%. So it's uh, significantly improved, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Light extraction is a fundamental problem also because of the change in the band structure of the semiconductor when you go from uh, high aluminum uh, from low aluminum containing layers, which have um, mostly TE polarized emission that can be easily extracted perpendicular to the surface to TM polarized emission, which actually likes to travel in the plane uh, of the semiconductor layers and therefore can be uh, is more harder to extract. And we can calculate the light extraction efficiency with Monte Carlo ray tracing simulation, as you can see here, there's a factor of four that you lose uh, with this uh, uh, drop, but you can do something about it. So um, this is uh, our latest result that has been just accepted in APL. So we have now uh, these micro pixel uh, LED arrays. Uh, each of those pixels is 1.5 microns in, in diameter and they have the slanted side walls that are dry etched and uh, covered with a silicon dioxide dielectric, a low index material that allows the light to be reflected downwards uh, through the substrate. And with that, we get a four times uh, enhancement in light extraction efficiency with these devices. Um, and therefore, with this, we can overall boost the efficiency of devices to 1.6% EQE. That's actually a new uh, record value, and we're quite happy and proud about this. And with that, I'd like to conclude my talk and uh, thank many, many uh, members of my group, students, uh, postdocs, uh, also colleagues from Fatim Brown Institute and uh, a number of collaborators and funding agencies. Thank you very much for your attention. So <clears throat> any questions?
comments? Hi, I'd like to ask a quick question. Oh, oh. Go ahead. Yeah. all right, I'll make it quick. A very nice talk. So you show that basically the, the efficiency of these uh, LEDs is likely to increase with the years. Is there any prediction of theoretical limits of the wall efficiency or the power that they can uh, generate? I mean, uh, so a theoretical limit would imply that there's something we cannot solve in, in the, on the way. So in terms of internal quantum efficiency, that basically is governed by the defects. I think there are many ways to reduce the defect densities. Uh, the point defects is a bit harder to, to tackle. Uh, in terms of current injection efficiencies, I think we also have ideas how to improve on that. Light extraction is going to be the, the toughest one because uh, normally use a, a silicone encapsulant uh, for light extraction. All the blue white LEDs have this encapsulant. If you add uh, such high photon energies, the problem is that most organic encapsulants do not hold up these high photon energies. And so finding something that you can use or maybe using a totally different approach like this micropixels might solve the problem. So I don't think there's a fundamental limit. It's just a hard, very hard engineering problem. Yeah. Okay. It's just time. Time and manpower, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the uh, efficiency of the LEDs is temperature dependent somewhat. So how did you handle the heat sinking and what uh, what's your temperature dependence over the efficiency? Um, so in, in, in terms of how they are mounted, they are most I mean, all the LEDs actually flip chip mounted. So the, the key contact is directly in contact sort of to the ceramic heat sink. So the thermal resistance depends a little bit on the on the kind of mounting you do and the ceramics you use and also the, the layout of your chip. So typically thermal resistance values are 10 Kelvin per watt or, or less. I mean, for the blue LEDs, you are at one or two Kelvin per watt. So um, I think the heat sinking is, is, is not the problem. So if of course we have heating in the chip during operation especially if you go to 500 milliamp and and, and uh, six seven volts uh, and as the temperature depends of the output power um, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head obviously with higher temperatures it decreases um, but I can't give you an exact value right now uh, for this 233 but it, it decreases let's say if you go from room temperature to to 80 uh, degrees Celsius probably decreases by a factor of two, something like this. But you wouldn't run it at 80 degrees Celsius typically if, you, if you're using your LEDs. Okay, question at the back. Thank you. Uh, is it my understanding that uh, there is uh, some uh, increasing number of research is gone hexagonal boron nitride as a candidate? Can you talk? About, can you just comment about the aluminum, aluminum nitride is the direction to go still, or what? What do you think about? It? Yeah, we had a, actually a workshop just before this workshop about discussing other materials that can be used for making UV emitters. Um, I mean, this hexagonal boron nitride is a cubic boron nitride, which is a stable phase of boron nitride. Um, um, and those have similar band gaps than the aluminum gallium nitride or aluminum nitride. So um, in principle, you can think about making LEDs with these materials, but there are still fundamental problems to be solved in these materials. Like here, we have all the components together. We know how to silicon, entope it, detope it, and uh, make it conductive. So this is not the case for these new materials. So I say it's it's interesting as a research project, but I think in the, let's say, realistic near-term future, what will happen in the next five years, I would think that I would add more, uh, put more money on the aluminum gallium nitride uh, technology. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. I have two questions regarding the slide that had the module with all the chips on it. That was about 51 or half a milliwatt total power. No, it, so per, cent, per square centimeter. So it's uh, it was 120 LEDs. And um, so in, in a five centimeter distance from the module, the intensity was 0.5 milliwatt per square centimeter over this 50 square centimeter area so 
50 times 0.5. Yeah. So do you have a number for cost per watt or cost per milliwatt um, for that particular generation of product? It's, it's not a product. It's a no, we research institute. Research so, sample. <laughs> so, um, um, and we built a couple of those, uh, actually, probably a dozen of these modules. Um, um, but you cannot look at the research institute and, and the costing for making an LED. So I, I would say for each LED, if it takes the epitaxy and the packaging and the uh, processing, uh, at this point, with a small scale, uh, it's maybe twenty, thirty dollars per chip, and and then of course, if you go to to larger volumes, you saw the numbers for the two sixty eight nanometer. I think that's a better comparison. So the two sixty eight nanometer, which are now produced in in larger scales in 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 companies, then you come to below. I mean, um, sorry, I don't have the the slide here, but it's definitely way below per uh, uh, cost per, per chip. So ten dollars gives you probably a hundred milliwatt in in that okay. range. So yeah. so that's a difference, but it's 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 just a matter of mass production and and doing it in a in a you know repetitive uh, high yield environment, not in a in a research institute. Okay. And I know we might have had it in the slide, but when do you think that would happen to get to that uh, commercial level, time wise? <laughs> that's uh, that's hard. I mean, I I I don't know. I mean, I think uh, I would say now we have seven or ten milliwatt power levels, and the production cost for the chip is not so different. If you do it, I mean, it's basically the same technology. The tax is the same. The the processing is the same. There's a different solutions, and the packaging is very similar. So um, I would say we are now more like a ten dollar a ten dollar per milliwatt at the moment. So I don't know how how it. One order of magnitude, how 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 quickly that uh, can be done. It really depends on improving the efficiency of the devices. I mean, to get more power out, and then the price per milliwatt will drop accordingly. So the efficiency needs to go up, the power needs to get up. I, I don't want to make predictions, which I which okay. I regret later. So, but it it will will improve. Okay. Final question is lifetime. On these far UVC, where, where is that today? I didn't touch it. Yeah, so this is a weak point um, because uh, so the ten thousand hours we have at two sixty eight or in this two fifty to two eighty nanometer wavelengths range, these point effects will or are affecting still the lifetime of the devices. So we see different degradation mechanisms. One is a fast one at the beginning, uh, and then there's a slower one uh, later on. So when you burn in these devices, um, then we we get lifetimes in the range of a thousand hours. But that's not enough, and you also don't want this burn in. So I think that is something we still have to work hard to overcome. So one hour, one thousand hours. Oh, one thousand hours. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think uh, five minutes behind, so I'm going to cut off questions. And thank uh, Dr. Kisa.